Katrina, and I'm the development manager here at CAE. And I just started here in the fall, so I'm going to try as much as I can to talk about kind of the older history of the building. Although before I was here, I actually worked at Jasper Hill for about five years doing their e-commerce, and so it's um, interesting to be here now having watched this place evolve and change over the years, kind of watching from a distance. Um, and I, my family and I left this area for a couple of years and we're living in southern Vermont and just moved back last year um, because we really missed it. This is an awesome place and a really special community and especially with respect to this work and the um, just kind of the, the energy and the drive around agricultural um, economy and community up here is really, uh, I think it's pretty special. You guys probably know more than I do about these things, but um, I look forward to hearing what you guys think about what you've seen so far also. Um, anything in particular that you guys are kind of hoping to hear about or questions you think you might have going in? Or do you just not know, are you blank slates at this point? <laughs> blank slates, yeah. okay, great. Um, I'll take off my coat now that I'm warmed up a little bit. So the CAE, the Center for an Agricultural Economy, is the nonprofit organization that operates the Vermont Food Venture Center, which is this building that we're in. Um, the CAE was founded in 2004. Um, this building was not built until 2010. It became operational in 2011. So in those <coughs> earlier years, it was kind of more of a think tank. Um, there was less action, a lot more kind of thinking and talking and organizing and hmm, kind of assessing, um, assessing needs and resources and kind of like the soil conditions, if you would, of the of the area and the agricultural economy. And um, 2010, there was a stimulus, stimulus bill, I can't remember the official name of it, but there was a you know, stimulus package um, funding available. And this building was originally, I believe it was originally intended as a different purpose that I can't recall, but um, something fell through. They were able to kind of shoo it in as a stimulus funded building, um, kind of at the last minute. but. Uh, uh, where was I going with that? Yeah, so that was 2011 that it became operational. And um, it was intended to, um, intended to service both local farmers and food, specialty food um, producers and value-added producers. And to also be a place where farmers could try, try out value-added products um, as a way to diversify their, their products and their markets. Um, and so when we built it, we really thought that um, the people using the kitchens would be kind of like 50-50 farmers and specialty food um, value-added producers. So we've got um, three, you'll see in the back, when we go into the back there, we have three commercial kitchens that um, are rented by the hour. And then we also have storage space and uh, some, about a third of the facility at this point is rented by an anchor tenant. Um, which is a really important piece of this, this kind of a model because you can't count on um, consistent enough uh, usage of the kitchens. You know, it, it changes and fluctuates month to month and then different parts of the year. So having that anchor tenant in there to have that kind of consi steady, consistent baseline for revenue is really important. Um, so the anchor tenant that's in there actually is Jasper Hill. They have a second cheese making facility inside and um, also now more cold storage. Um, did, when you guys were meeting with Jasper Hill, did you visit the farm or the cellars? You just did a tasting with them or what? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, yeah, so they, when they um, started out, they had um, you know, the dairy in Greensboro and they built the cellars in like 2008 or so, I think, 2006. Um, and quickly outgrew um, the, sto the cold storage in particular. So that the um, one of part of, well, I'll talk about that when we go in the back. It'll make more sense when we're looking at the map. I'll talk a little more now about our programs now and what we do. So our programs at CAE are um, kind of have three general areas. We have community programs, which are really locally based, and we work closely with um, partners in the town, partner organizations, faith-based organizations, community groups, community gardeners. Um, we have programs for food businesses, which are largely targeted in the Northeast Kingdom, because we are in this kind of um, economically depressed part of the state. 
and there is a lot of rich agricultural uh, resources that we want to provide services for these food businesses and for farmers um, to really thrive in, in, this, in this part of the state, which has um, historically been you know, more economically depressed, has more poverty, um, has some challenges and transportation challenges. Uh, so kind of within these three categories, um, we're focused you know, really locally, regionally, but then also we have um, food and farm clients from all over the state. And so it's not only here, but it is kind of starting here, focused here, a little bit bigger, and then kind of looking outward. Um, so within our community programs, Atkins Field is a community commons, which is, um, I should drive by it if it wasn't super confusing to get there. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's given that it was a little hard for you guys to make it, I'll make it here. Um, maybe, maybe not great, but uh, it's where Hardwick has its local farmer's market in the summertime. Um, it, historically, it was a granite, um, granite shed and granite processing finishing um, space. The Woodbury Granite Company had a huge granite operation there around the turn of the century. And Hardwick itself was like a really a granite town. That's what drove the economy. And then that fell off in the 30s. And the town is, the economy in the town has really kind of been struggling, you could say, for the last 100 years since then. But at Atkins Field, there's this beautiful historic granite shed and some cool... Um, artifacts and relics in the fields and you can't like dig a shovel full of soil for getting a chunk of granite in it <laughs> it's, it's rocks everywhere in the ground from all of the um, decades of the work that they were doing down there uh, our community gardens are at Atkins Field um, the farmers market happens there we are building a pavilion so we just finished a grassroots fundraising um, campaign to build this pavilion and do some trail improvements um, and couple other little projects uh, at the site to make it kind of a more ro robust community resource um, where kids can come with their classes while they're in school and do outdoor education. They can use the gardens and do kind of like farm to school activities there. Um, the pavilion will provide more shelter for year round activity. So that was a really big, uh, important to us and important to the community. That was a vision developed with the community. Um, Grow Your Own is a food independence project that we run with the Hardwick Area Food Pantry. Um, and grow, so food pantry members and anyone in the area can come for free to workshops um, about seed starting or crock pot cooking or container planting or whatnot. And um, Grow Your Own has its own steering committee that sets those uh, workshop topics, um, which are often like things that pantry clients want to learn more about. So it's a fun thing. Um, NEK Tours, so anyone heard of the book, The Town That Food Saves? Really? Oh, you're nodding, okay, good. <laughs> um, that was published in what, like 2008, I think, ish, and um, so in those two years before this facility existed, that's one thing CAE found themselves doing a lot of, was giving Northeast Kingdom food tours, um, sort of because, because of the popularity of that book, and people wanting to come see the town that food had saved and then coming here and you know, seeing the reality of that, which is more complex, of course, than the book. Um, uh, reality is always more complex than any book. <laughs> uh, education. So we do a lot of place-based education work with our school system. And it started as um, you know, kind of small-scale farm to school. It was really based on what individual teachers were interested in seeing and doing in their classes, um, making connections with classroom and uh, community businesses and organizations. So like, if kids are doing a unit on uh, sugaring, like connecting them with a maple farmer so they can go visit the farm, if you know, and then also relate that to their math unit if they're talking about dilutions and concentrations or something like that. Um, and at this point, we're actually doing a lot at the supervisory union level. So the OSSU, Orlean Southwest Supervisory Union, is really um, on board with this work. They're really excited about it. Um, and so are we. So it's a great, I've got two kids in the elementary school system here and it's, it's really gratifying to see the work that they're doing and then the work that's happening here, you know, when I see that, the end result of that come home with my child um, is a cool thing. And then NICO. So NICO is Northeast Kingdom Organizing. That started as a listening project that we did, um, I think with the Hardwick Area Food Pantry. Um, and we were really expecting to identify food access issues, maybe more than anything else. Um, 
And what came out of the listening campaign was, yes, some food access, but really mostly food access was not the challenge. The other challenges were things like transportation or opioid addiction or um, challenges to driver, having a driver's license not suspended, <laughs> which is a transportation challenge. But um, we kind of realized like this wasn't totally in our ballpark, um, but we wanted to be part of the work and we wanted to see the work continue and succeed. So Nico was a new organization that was founded and CAE is a founding member of Northeast Kingdom Organizing. Um, they are now in the process of becoming their own independent 501c3, but will always continue to be a member. Um, food, food businesses and farmer programs. Um, so we have, we have really crowded office space. Each of these rooms, there's like three or four people crammed into them. And the um, business services office is a really uh, busy and exciting one, but also one where on any given day of the week, like half of the team might be out in the field visiting farmers um, and doing advising or whatever. Um, so we do business advising, business planning with um, food businesses and with farmers. Um, we have free production kitchens that are, as I said, are rented by the hour. So if someone has like a home business, you know, making salsa or um, crackers, and they've kind of like scaled it, it's, it's currently at a scale that they can produce out of their home kitchen, like a certified home catering kitchen, but they want to take it to the next step before investing and renting their own space that's dedicated. That's a huge uh, cost to them. They can try it out here for 25 bucks an hour. And there's a little more cost involved with that because, uh, you know, the, the client intake meeting has a small fee and there's, you know, the planning that they want to put into that. So it's not only 25 bucks, but it's much, much less than committing to renting their own space for six months or a year. Um, so we op operate those production kitchens. We also have storage. Um, storage is something that if we had more, it would be filled more. It seems to be like a high demand for both food, food businesses and farmers. <coughs> um, food safety training. That's another thing where if you have someone who's been cooking out of their home and you know, crossing the T's and dotting the I's, but to, when you're taking it to the next level, the liability increases and food safety becomes more important. And uh, with FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act and other regulatory changes, it's just a really shifting landscape, um, can be hard to keep up with. And so that's a service that we offer for, um, for food businesses. And we've started to do more kind of like marketing consulting as well. So we have a um, co-marketing manager who's also our CAE communications um, person. And she sits in on those uh, intake meetings with our business advisor and food safety advisor. Um, workshops, we'll do workshops. Not sure how many we do a year, but I think between six and 10. And those are on varying topics. There are some topics that happen every year, like QuickBooks trainings or um, what's the one we just had, Surf Safe. Um, and then sometimes it's things like search engine optimization, which you know, like your average small business or small farm may not know much about on their own. And the Vermont Equipment Access Program, that's a program that um, we operate with the Mad River Food Hub. And it offers, um, you can lease equipment that would otherwise be extremely expensive to purchase on your own. So again, if you're in this home kitchen situation and you're scaling up your um, production, but you don't want, you're not ready to buy a $50,000 um, bottle capper, or whatever it is, uh, bottle filler, um, you can lease equipment through them at a, at a very reasonable rate. For farmers, we also do business advising. Um, I believe this is focused in the Northeast Kingdom, not necessarily as regional. Um, storage rental, value added production. I'm gonna come back to that because it's, it's a little bit more um, involved. Facility assessment, so we might go to, go to a farm and visit them. And, um, and it's part, kind of part of the business planning is what they, where the facilities would need as investments. Um, and the Vermont Farm Fund is a revolving loan program. Have you guys been to Pete's Greens as part of your tour? Drove right by Big Sign. Okay. Yeah, they're, um, they're an awesome year-round organic veggie grower, um, which started, I think, as like a high school project growing greens um, through the winter in a greenhouse. And then when Pete Johnson, you know, came out of high school and college, he just kept doing it. And it's... Now it's one of the largest farms in the Grassbury area, but certainly. Um, but the, in 2011, their barn burned down. It was the same month that my husband and I moved to the Northeast Kingdom. 
and um, so many people, neighbors and friends and other businesses, um, made donations to help build the new barn because it was like a lot of their winter CSA storage is in there, a lot of equipment. Um, and Pete was just really overwhelmed by the generosity of all of it. And so when he built his new barn, um, which is much bigger and better in a lot of ways, so you know, kind of a good outcome in some ways, um, he founded the Vermont Farm Fund, which is a revolving loan fund. So he put some of that money that had been given to him in there as seed money, and we've gotten additional gifts over the years. Um, and now uh, payments coming in from farmers on their loans are you know, filling it back up so that it, new loans can go out for businesses that are in growth or transition, um, or that have emergencies like a fire. Um, I want to come back to this value-added production piece. So I said that when we built this facility and it started operating in 2011, we kind of thought it was going to be about half farmers and half specialty food producers, um, and it wasn't. It was like two-thirds or three-quarters specialty food producers and it's like a third or a quarter farmers. And um, we realized that it's a lot harder for a farmer to try and figure out how to add on a new like value added product to a farm operation, which is already increased incredibly complex and time consuming and has you know, very high inputs for the output that you get. Um, than it is for especially food business who is like, that's, that's their whole business. They're not also growing all the crops typically or growing all of the inputs. Um, and so at, over the first few years, we kind of were trying to figure out how we could make it, how we could fulfill that part of our mission to also serve farmers um, and not only especially food businesses in a way that makes sense um, for them because the, the farmers that we did have coming in here to do value added products, it was, they, it was typically not tenable in the long term. Um, and so over time we started to do that ourselves. So we would buy, right now we buy produce from uh, more than a dozen local farms. We do minimally processed fresh produce. So we wash and quarter, peel them. Um, about a dozen root crops mostly, carrots, turnips, beets, etc. cetera. Um, and we sell those to um, schools and local institutions, hospitals. Um, so that's our farm to institution um, business, which is called Just Cut, that's the brand name. And right now we have a crew of three people, three and a half people who's in here four days a week cutting vegetables. And that's all going out to hospitals and schools, um, including like our local elementary school, which is teeny and like um, UVM Medical Center and Dartmouth Hitchcock. So pretty big spread, but it's also still in its growth stages. We're kind of trying to figure out where, where it will grow and how much it will grow. Um, but that is right now that's kind of filling the balance for us on the farmer side. We do have some farms come in and do value added production, but for the most part, we've been able to fulfill that part of our mission by providing another market for farmers for their wholesale product um, without them having to take on all of that work themselves and staff it, um, which has been working pretty well. <laughs> we always had challenges like um, finding enough carrots certain times of year, finding enough beets that are the right diameter. Uh, it's funny, sometimes it's really easy to find little beets everywhere and really hard to find two inch beets. Um, and reliability, you know, uh, you no know, one can predict the weather or the crops. And um, sometimes we, if there's widespread crop failures in this part of the state, we have to go a little farther to find that local produce. So occasionally we'll bring in vegetables from uh, Western Mass or sometimes Quebec. But for the most part, it's within 50 miles of there, or if you hard um, so I know I went through that a little bit quickly and jerkily, but questions so far about any of these things or stuff that you're, that sparks your interest? Um, I, I will also say before I, um, so I'll turn it over to you, um, I don't have a food systems, food planning background. So my background is in this food system and I've worked through Jasper Hill and I've, um, worked with other small local producers in different capacities. Um, but I'm interested in your viewpoints, uh, such as you have them, or questions that you guys have. Yeah. You mentioned the stimulus package mm -hmm. that you guys got in the beginning. Where did that funding come from? It was federal funding. Um, it was in the first couple years of Obama, Obama's first term. Um, and it was, I wasn't, I had just moved to the Hardwick 
when the building was like already going up. So I don't know, and I'm not as intimate with the, that process. Um, but it was it was part of that whole stimulus push. I mean, I remember there was um, like a stimulus benefit for buying a car for in like 2009. You remember that, or like 2010? And it was part of like trying to jumpstart the economy after the 2008 recession. And so some of that was also funding for. Um, I'm not going to try to make up the type of facility because I don't know, uh, you know, how it was designated on their end. But um, this this type of facility as a food hub, um, an incub business incubator, fell into that category of funding. Yeah, I would also mention um, in 2011, CAE drafted this with other organizations. It's the Regional Food Systems Plan for Vermont's Northeast Kingdom, and this was updated in 2016. Um, and I have not yet read all of this, but it's available online, and I'm happy to send a copy with your class if you'd like one. Um, but that's an excellent resource, and uh, our exec the executive director, who just recently left the organization, um, kind of was the point person on that, along with um, NBDA, Northeastern Vermont Development Association, and some other partners. Yeah? This is not really... Where is the closest hospital to here? Closest hospital is Copley Hospital in Morrisville, um, but I think the l larger than that, I believe, is um, NVH, the one up towards Newport. <laughs> oh, wow. um, yeah, and then a lot of, you know, for, for specialized things, a lot of people go to Burlington or Dartmouth. Um, but yeah, like I had my babies at Copley because it's close. Um, Northeast in Vermont Regional Hospital, NVRH, I think that's the one up in Newport area. Uh, or maybe it's in St. Johnsbury. Sorry. The other direction. Um, yeah, but if you get referred to a specialist, most people are going to um, Burlington or Dartmouth. Part of it does have a, a health center, but it's. It does have a health center, much, yeah. Uh, a health center, like a. Uh, go for regular checkups and get referred for and like a test or something. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, you go there if your kid has an ear infection or if, to see your primary care provider. Um, or if you think you have a broken wrist, but then this, to, get, to diagnose your broken wrist, they would send you somewhere else for the x-ray. Yeah, it's one of the challenges for sure of um, life in this area or business in this area also. I mean, that's um, the three counties in the Northeast Kingdom are like the least, le the least populated in the state and the, the resources of say like healthcare providers to residents are much higher than in other parts of the state. So you have to go a lot farther to get the same services. Yeah. This is one reason that we wanted this facility to be based here. The Vermont Food Ventures Center had an iteration in Fairfax, Vermont before it was moved here, um, but I believe it was only a processing kitchen. It did not have business services running out of it, um, to my knowledge. By the way, Daniel Keeney is yeah. a CDA graduate. Cool. Yeah, he's our, he's our farm business advisor um, who is about to be out on paternity leave, like any, maybe on Monday, I don't know, any day. <laughs> yeah, uh, but he does a lot of this, <laughs> especially this, that's Daniel's kind of uh, ballpark. But Daniel, Daniel Keeney is our business, farm business advisor. Connor Gorham is our facilities manager who's been here since um, a couple months after this building became operational, so he's got a great long view. Um, and the two of them and our co-marketing manager meet with every client who comes through the door. So just to um, assess where a business is in their readiness, um, we really spend, oh, especially over the years, we've learned it's important to spend some time with them and really understand where they're coming from, what their expectations are, what they're hoping to get out of this, um, how ready they are to jump into it. because. You know, if you're starting with a small kitchen scale operation, you're not going to start cranking out pallets of sauce every week um, without some hiccups. So, and, and then if you do, like, do you have a marketing plan in place to support that? Do you have a business plan? Do you know how to approach small grocers? Um, there's a lot of small pieces. So there's some numbers out in the facility that I'll show you when we walk out to see the warehouse. Um, but in the first few years of this building, this operation, we worked with a higher number of businesses. Um, and in the last few years, that number of businesses has gone down, and a lot of that was is the result of what we call like the tire kickers, kind of coming in to like kick the tires and see see what's going on, um, try it out, take it for a spin, and it, but it not always working out. And so part of um, formalizing that intake process a little bit 
and having the, those three people devote two hours of their time to talking through all those pieces um, is to really make sure that if you come in for the kitchen, the 25 bucks an hour in the kitchen session, that you're ready to, you're going to benefit from it and you're ready for it. Um, and so part, part of what that means is that in the last couple of years we've said to more people, maybe you're not ready for this, or they've said that to themselves, oh, maybe I'm not ready for this, <laughs> once they see kind of like the implications of all of these different factors, like the food safety, like the packaging and the marketing. Um, but we also see that as a success of time in the space, in this space. and oftentimes those businesses will come back a year later and say, oh, okay, I think I'm ready now, and now I want to try it out. Um, yeah, yes? Are there any immigrant families or groups, or you guys call them new Americans, too, that are living in this area and, and taking advantage of these programs? There are. Um, I don't know them by name or, you know, by, by demographic, but I, I, think, I believe so, yeah. Um, in Brownington, actually, there's also a lot of Amish farms um, that have kind of come to the area from, I'm not sure where outside of Vermont, but um, that's just an interesting anecdote. <laughs> and also a challenge for Daniel to try and track them down. And whenever they call, he's going to kind of stop what he's doing and get to the phone because he has, can't call them back. Um, but yeah, I don't know like, other statistics on that. Yeah. Yeah. So how do these um, community and enterprise support programs that you offer fit in with the larger CAE like mission just as it stands? Yeah. Um, and our mission is to, I'm not going to remember it verbatim. <laughs> it's, in the, it's in this book. Um, our mission is to support local farms um, and food businesses and, and the community that they're in and uh, to create these kind of integrated, interconnected communities that um, are thriving together. So it's not just helping the farm in isolation, it's helping the farm in the context of the resources and the people and the communities and the opportunities around them. Um, and so a lot of these programs have kind of come out of identified needs um, that we've heard after working with a business or seeing trends after working with several businesses um, and seeing like, oh, there's really a need for, um, for access to equipment at a more reasonable rate, for example. Or, um, you know, we have this Atkins Field property, which is a great resource, but the town doesn't have the bandwidth to um, manage the programming around it. And, um, but a lot of people seem to want that. And so, for example, our community programs have grown a lot in the last five years, um, kind of stemming out of the farm to school work and the Atkins Field space. Um, you know, we, Northeast Kingdom Organizing is, is a community organizing group. Um, and I'm just beginning to become literate in like what that means. But it's interesting to me to see the parallels between what they're doing and this like not, not for us without us mentality of really like from the bottom up getting input from the stakeholders and then kind of looking at how CAE has evolved over the years. And it's very much been the same way. Our board has been made up of farmers and food business, specialty food businesses. Um, and it's, it's similar in, in that it's like we hear from these communities what is needed and then kind of develop the programs in response to that um, with that input instead of saying, oh, I think, I think farms need this and then having it not necessarily work out. Um, yeah? Do you know like how much of the um, food that's produced in farms in Vermont stays in Vermont? Oh, gosh. Um, the Var Vermont Farm to Plate, are you familiar with Vermont Farm to Plate Network? Um, they have a goal by 2020 to have, is it 20% um, of food consumed in Vermont grown in Vermont? And I think we're at like seven or eight percent. Correct me if anyone knows the actual number, um, but we're like, we're, we're getting close to that. So um, I would say not, not that much, but <laughs> Farm to Plate has kind of, um, the last meeting I went to was a couple years ago, and at that time they were um, impressed with the progress they had made so far. It might um, be higher now, actually. Yeah. I just went to the meeting, but I can't Did you? remember. I think it was like maybe over 10%, but a large portion of that was beer. Mm -hmm. Like it was like, a fun, like the value added, like kind of skewed the numbers a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I yeah. Think they made a lot of progress. And craft beer is certainly blown up. Also cider, 
distillers, but I don't know what categories are included in that. Um, yeah, we would certainly like to see it be much higher. And in this plan, in the you know the food system plan for the Northeast Kingdom, um, local food consumption is a huge part of it. Um, there's, there's, a, there's also a couple of questions wrapped into there in, in that 7% or 10% of the food consumed by Vermonters being grown in Vermont is, is not the same as 10% of the food grown in Vermont is consumed by Vermonters, right? right? So, so there's a big portion right. of food that is produced yes. in Vermont that gets shipped elsewhere or that yeah. gets turned into um, animal feed or, or, or the like. And yeah. then there's also in the sort of grand scheme of things only a four month growing season for us to grow food in Vermont. And so there's a lot of months when we're consuming a whole lot of food that is necessarily imported at, at, yeah. at the moment. Um, yeah. So there's a few, a few different pieces uh, in there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I, I don't have the answers to that. It's <laughs> a really good question. Um, Okay, any other questions before we go out into the warehouse? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Oh, I great. Kind of about, like, local stuff. Um, the stores mm -hmm. around here, like, especially the specialty ones and stuff, mm -hmm. and other restaurants and things like that, are they mostly relying on, like, uh, people from the community to buy their goods and stuff, or is there, like, a large tourist industry? The, there is a lot of summer tourism, I would say. It's largely second homeowners in this area. Um, you know, I spent two years in southern Vermont, and there's a really different feeling there about like um, the tour tourist economy and the impact that has on the overall economy in other in those parts of the state, um, which I have not seen visually uh, happening here. So it, you know, in, in Brattleboro during leaf peeping season, it's just like a stream of cars going up and down Route 30, and like it's it's kind of hazardous. <laughs> there's just so many people out, and. Um, yeah, a lot more of the economy is, is based on, on people coming up from Boston and New York. That doesn't make it this far up in the state. Um, but there is some, some impact, and summer is definitely a busier time. Uh, communities like Greensboro have like about 700 residents year-round. In the summertime, that, that doubles. Uh, and it's mostly lakeside uh, rentals or lakeside second homes. Um, someone told me, I think, that Orleans County has the highest percentage of second homeowners per capita um, in the state, which I thought was interesting because it's also one of the least populated parts of the state. <laughs> but, um, you know, so I think per capita they have more second homes, but just not as many capita as they have in other counties <laughs> in the south. <laughs> but you see that's like okay, like it seems to be integrated well. Yeah, I think in individual communities struggle more or less with it. Um, and Hardwick is not really impacted by that very much because uh, it's not a, a town, a community that has a lot of second home. There's no, there's no lake in Hardwick, yeah. you know, the, or there's no skiing like right in Hardwick. We're, we're sort of equidistant from a lot of those amenities like Kingdom Trails and various ski resorts and various lakes. Um, but a lot of those, a lot of that traffic is, doesn't stay here. Whereas in Greensboro, you do see a double and it's like Willie's Gross General Store um, is, is also like a very high traffic area in the summertime um, because of all, all that that change, that seasonal change. Um, so, yeah, it's my, I guess it's more community by community um, than than overall. Yeah. Is there a lot of agriculture in this region? Yes, and it's growing. Mm -hmm. So these like the food system tours that we've done um, have grown. I think year year by year, they're they're steadily growing. And Sterling College at the School of the New American Farmstead um, has certainly, like, that's bringing more people up, both for professional training, but also that, that's largely agritourism as well. Like, I'm going to go learn about bread for a couple of weeks and stay in this beautiful place. Like, and that's great. Um, we are, that, and that's something that may, that may grow over the next few years, especially out of that particular partnership, is like as they grow that um, part of their academic curriculum. and. Um, there's some other regional um, opportunities that may arise around like recreation and, and agritourism to kind of highlight that a little more. Um, I think it's a growth area for yeah. sure. Yeah. I think, I think people often talk about uh, 
the, the food resurgence in this area with the names of specific individuals. Yeah. So, so people will mention Ben Hewitt and will mention Pete Johnson, will mention Andrew Meyer, mm -hmm. um, uh, will mention the Keelers. Mm -hmm. I think many people would mention Sarah Waring. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to, what, to what degree do you think the town that food saves phenomenon <laughs> was a, a function of a unique combination of extraordinary individuals versus a set of favorable institutions and contexts and, yeah. and other, other sort of factors? I'd say it's both and. Um, almost certainly would not have been as accelerated without the personalities that were involved. Um, Andrew Meyer owns Vermont Soy and Vermont Natural Coatings. Um, the, the other names you made, the Keeler brothers who own Jasper Hill, um, Tom, Stearns. Tom Stearns who started High Mowing Seeds, all really energized, quick, ambitious visionaries, frankly, um, uh, for better or for worse. <laughs> and it comes with a lot of stress, um, but also comes with a lot of great ideas and also willingness to identify or, or see a great idea and help usher that forward and not just say, oh, that's good, someone should do that. Um, they, all of those personalities really are like, oh, great, let's do that right now. Um, and then you kind of have to hurry up um, to make it happen <laughs> after they pull the trigger. Um, yeah. It's, I think also one, one thing that all of those businesses have in common is that they're all, you know, they, they, they can be challenging places to, to, to work, um, challenging places to be, but also because there is a high expectation for... Um, quality and growth and impact. Um, and like Jasper Hill, for example, is one of the largest employers. Um, it may not be the largest employer in Greensboro. A couple years ago, they, there was a tree, tree servicing business that had more employees, but they were like number two or number three or something. And I'm, now I'm not sure where that falls. But um, so, you know, there, there is this impact of like more jobs in the working landscape, and, um, but it comes with stress points also. Uh, one of our board members, I won't say who, said that um, thinks people perform the best when they're always a little bit stressed out. And <laughs> Sarah Waring told me, told me about this, and she said, always? <laughs> you really want them to always be a little stressed out? Um, but, uh, you know, it says, says something to the, um, the initiative, I guess, yeah, the sense of urgency. Yeah. Um, when we go out into the warehouse, it is a challenging space for a large group because it has kind of a lot of narrow corridors. Um, so as we go out through here, there's a map, and we're going to stop by the map, and I'll show you all the different parts of the building. Um, and there's also some numbers on the wall uh, indicating like the, the number of farmers and food businesses that we've served over the, over the years since this place has been open. So we can talk a little bit about those numbers. And then um, I'll walk you through to see the kitchens, but um, we're not going to go into any kitchen spaces because I don't want to do hair nets and there's no production happening and we wouldn't all fit in there anyways. Um, so we'll walk by those spaces and I'll point them out as we go through them. I just want to point out this mural before we go in. Um, 2014, that's when it was painted. I was like, when did Tara do that? Does anyone know Tara Garo? who's in murals at Pete's Greens, at Jasper Hill, at City Market, all over Vermont. Um, she's a really phenomenal mural artist, and she did this in like a weekend. Um, but we, we had this put up because we wanted to show not just the fun and sexy parts of the food system, like eating at a farm-to-table restaurant and like the farmer you see on PBS, but the whole cycle that it takes to do that and that you need you know, regenerative agriculture to support these systems so you have more inputs going into the land and you're not taxing the land and you need the supply chain and you need you know, food safe processing facilities. So we, um, we wanted the hairnet to be front and center because the hairnet is just as sexy as the farmer um, or the farm to table restaurant um, and just as important. I mean, all of these pieces are really just as important. But so that's one reason we kind of had this, um, had this made up. Um, behind you guys, some of you already saw this little table, sorry. <laughs> uh, this table is a sampling of products that have been made at the Vermont Food Venture Center. 
And um, this is maybe like 20% uh, products that have been made here over the years. So um, obviously a lot of things that would be perishable can't sit on our shelf for years. Um, <laughs> so this is uh, really just the shelf stable things. Although it does also kind of represent um, the type of equipment that we have uh, is really good for like high acid shelf stable canned things like salsa or jams and jellies or simmer sauces or whatnot. So we have seen a lot of um, products of that nature come through here. Um, also granola, beverages, um, yeah, for veggie burgers, um, a lot of variety. Uh, but this is just to give you kind of a sense of some of the, um, some of those products, what they are. And also some of these businesses like Yummy Yummy, I'm not actually sure if they're still in production, if they've moved on. Um, you know, some of them are pretty small kitchen operations. And then we also did like this limited run of caramel sauce from Lake Champlain Chocolates, which is really much more established business, but wanted to try out a certain type of product that they didn't have the equipment for or that didn't work in their other space. We're talking with a jam producer right now who has like a pretty booming jam business, but wants to make certain products here that have allergens that they don't want to have in their other facility. Um, and so sometimes we see you know, larger businesses engage with certain products like that. And sometimes it's really these small and emergent businesses that are still kind of figuring it out. Um, and success for us is when they, they work here for a period of time, a year, a few years, and then outgrow it. You know, it's so successful that then they need to go into their own bigger space or they sell the business or some, you know, something, something good comes out of that. Um, but sometimes it's, you know, it's a different process. What would you say the average time is that people use the space? Uh, it's such a huge, it varies a lot. Yeah. Like we have people who come every week right now um, and then clients who come like once a year. And we have a, a schools, um, like St. Johnsbury Academy and a couple of other schools come once a year to bottle like a blackberry syrup that they've made or maple syrup. Um, Hill Farmstead does a barrel aged maple syrup and they, it's okay, uh, they'll come bottle their syrup once a year. High Mowing Seeds actually um, packs their sprouting mixes here because they're, um, when you're sprouting seeds and you're not going to cook them, it, they have to be packed in the food safe space. Um, so they can't pack them in their normal seed packing warehouse or whatever. So they did that once a year for like two weeks at a, two weeks straight. Um, but yeah, it's, it uh, varies a lot depending on the type of business. Okay, I'm gonna move back through here. Um, it looks like the lights have gone off. I'm gonna go kick on the lights. But we can gather right on the other side of this door by this map on the wall. And I'll be right back, hopefully with some light on. Yeah. <laughs> Come on over. A map of the facility. And there's three, 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 four zones, three zones. Zone one is our office. Um, that's where we just were. Zone two is warehouse, but not food safe space. So where we're standing right now, we don't have to have walk, walk through a foot bath. We don't have to have a hairnet on or have protective clothing. Um, zone three is our production kitchens, so that is food safe space. So if you go in there, you're stepping through a foot bath, you're washing your hands, you're putting on a hair net or beer net. Um, and zone four is our anchor tenant. So this anchor tenant space is Jasper Hill um, cheese production. Right now the cheese made here is picked up when it's a few days old and taken up to Greensboro and aged in the cellars. And then more, more often than not, coming down here for, uh, to stay in cold storage. All of their pallets, I believe, that get picked up from distributors are built down here. So it's not an ideal uh, logistical <laughs> situation for them, but they've kind of outgrown their, their existing space in certain ways. Um, so that's, that's what we're looking at. This was originally uh, planned to be a meat cell for like a value-added meat production, dry cured salami or sausages. Um, that never materialized. Um, it was beer storage for a number of years for a local brewer, and then um, became available and Jasper Hill jumped on the opportunity for more cold, cold storage. Uh, so they have their own receiving bay for milk and dairy, but everyone shares this main loading dock for other deliveries, so it can get a little hectic. Uh, we have one facilities manager, but his job is um, also to like help out in the kitchens and also be in those client intake meetings. So on any given day, any number of us could get pulled over to the warehouse door to um, receive a shipment or help a tra truck driver find what he's picking up or whatnot. Um, in our three kitchens, 
is identified as wet, raw, and multi-purpose. Um, the wet kitchen is the one that has like floor vents, or floor drains, and steam vents. So cooked products usually happen in there: jams, jellies, um, tomato sauces, salsas, or whatnot. Um, the raw kitchen is where we do all the fresh, minimally processed vegetable production for Just Cut, which is our farm to institution line. Um, and then the multi-purpose kind of can be either. It was originally intended to be a bakery, and um, like the meat cell, the baker clients just kind of didn't come or didn't materialize. And so uh, after the first couple of years, we added the floor drains and the vents to that space so that these could be more flexible. And if we have the same type of client who um, wants to come in on the same day, uh, we have some flexibility to move equipment around between those kitchens um, if needed. It can be a little tight if like both want the piston filler on a certain day, so we still have to pay attention to that. Um, these are the numbers I was talking about for the number of businesses that we saw in the early years versus the most recent years, and also the number of hours in use in the facility. So the number of hours in use has gone up you know, almost double what it was in 2012. Um, but the number of clients per year has actually gone down. And part of that is um, kind of really fine tuning what it takes to succeed with these resources. And um, really being intentional about the readiness of, of businesses before they, before they start that process. Um, and also, this is when we started Just Cut. So this is, um, these years there was maybe more farm customers coming in trying out value added products, which did not come back on us more often than not. And then here, um, Just Cut was picking up kind of more of that kitchen time um, ourselves. So kind of filling that, filling that gap for um, the farm businesses. And so Just Cut right now uses about half of our annual kitchen hours in 2018. Um, and it could do more, but it would take a lot more people. <laughs> and another Connor, our facilities manager. Uh, yeah. Um, we can walk through here. I will try, I'll try to be loud so I can point out what we're seeing. Uh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the compost operation at the bottom there? Yeah. Uh, Black Dirt Farm is a farm in Basin Standard. And they pick up all of our compost and food scraps. Um, they're a fee-for-service business, so it's the, you know, it, it's a paid service. Um, they sell the compost, um, but it's awesome because compost <laughs> doesn't happen on site here. It does not happen on site here. It happens at their farm. Yeah. They've got, I think, chickens first have their first pick, and they also sell eggs, and then whatever the chickens haven't uh, chosen goes into like windrows or some other comp composting system. They also sell like worm worm meal and worm yeah, worm cast. That's what it is. You had a question? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, how involved are you in the production process? Do these companies come in and use their own people and products, or and then just use the space? Or yeah. Space? Good question. They, um, in the first couple years, we offered our time, like they could come in the first time, show us their recipe, and then we would do it for them. It really did not work very well. Um, so they, when clients come in now, they are using their own labor. Um, they can pay to have Connor work alongside them, I think, um, but that's alongside their staff. It's not doing it like for them. Um, and that's, he trains them initially. So the first session he's there for free. And then if they want him with their, uh, with them for additional sessions, then it would be for a fee. Um, yeah. That's just, we found that has worked the best just for a number of reasons. Um, great. Any questions? We're going to walk slowly through here. Um, I want to point out this pallet of dishes uh, <laughs> at Atkins Field a couple years ago. We had the world record for the most people simultaneously dishwashing after a community event. It was part of a waste reduction event with Central Vermont, um, Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District. Um, and we still have the plates. Uh, <laughs> so we use those for a lot of community events that happen or lend them out to other organizations. Um, so we've got client storage mostly. This is like a pallet of glassware. Pallets of potatoes waiting to get cut by Just Cut. A loading dock. Um, so this is all dry storage. This is our walk-in freezer. 
which is very full right now because the local meat processor had a freezer problem over last week. Um, but also is like pretty full year round. Uh, cold storage, if we could make this place bigger, if we could add one more thing, it would probably be more cold storage, frozen and fresh. Um, we also have a blast freezer, second small freezer, and a refrigerator. And right now, we can't really offer a lot of refrigerated storage to clients because so much of our own produce for Just Cut is going in and out of there. And that's, um, that's like large deliveries, multiple pallets of produce at a time coming in and then going out a few days later. Um, I'm gonna walk back this way. This is where the kitchens are. We're not going into the kitchens, but you can kind of see down there at the end is the multi-purpose kitchen. This one behind me is the, um, the raw kitchen where Just Cut does all of our vegetable processing. And behind you, the red sheets, those are all the different vegetable products that we make for institutions. Um, it's a lot of uh, one inch dice and shredded, shredded vegetables. Our goal with that program is not for it to ever be profitable, but to cover its own costs. Um, and it's still getting there. <laughs> so behind you, this is something we're working on for our efficiencies. Um, week to week, um, you know, which varies a lot depending on like the labor we have and other factors, but looking at how much it costs us to produce a crop and then what a product and then what we're selling it for. And so some things, um, you know, our loss leaders, we're actually losing money on them, but then other things we're making, making more money on. And potatoes really make up the vast majority of those, um, the pounds going out. So when it's hard to find potatoes, it, it is really difficult <laughs> uh, for us. Why is that? Why potatoes? Why potatoes? I think they're just really popular in institutions for like um, hash and uh, not for french fries. We don't do french fries anymore, but um, Peasley's Potatoes is a large potato farm in the Northeast Kingdom, I think we're in Orleans County, um, that was for sale for some time and hasn't been in operation. And they have a new owner, which we're excited to work with, but um, that's one crop just as an example that has been um, challenging to find enough local product to keep up with the demands, institutional demands. Um, this kitchen over here is the, um, the wet kitchen where more like cooking, jams, salsas would be done. And then down at the end is a scullery which has shared small wares for all of these kitchens. So part of the training that Connor does with businesses when they come in is showing them where, where to find everything, how to clean it and put it back. Uh, but we also build in a cleaning fee because it's almost inevitable that he'll have to spend some time helping to clean equipment afterwards. We're going to walk this way. This is Jasper Hill Cold Storage. The lights are not on right now, um, but it's just palletized cold storage. So, um, you know, large uh, double decker pallet stacking. <laughs> it's a great view. <laughs> uh, on the other side of this wall is their production area. So in here it's like 45, 40 degrees, it's very cold. And in here it's like 85 or 90 in the make room. Really different. Um, and that's because here they're trying to grow cultures and grow organisms. And in there they're trying to stop them. Because they've already grown, they've already done their work, and now they just need to stay as they are while a product is, before a product goes out to sale. So uh, in the winter they have a really sweet work setup because it's like so nice and warm and balmy in there all, all day. Um, but in the summertime it's pretty rough because it's hot and it's humid. <laughs> uh, and these are pallets of client storage. So like Waz Kitchen Creations is one of our, um, they do a number of different jams and sauces and clients can rent dry storage space as well as cold storage. I was wondering, do you guys receive any uh, funding from the state? Mm -hmm. Yes, and the federal government, and private in, private foundations, and individuals, um, all all of it. <laughs> it's a, uh, I mean, our our annual operating budget is a little over a million dollars. It takes a lot to run all of these programs. Yeah. Um, so certain programs are more kind of philanthropically funded, and others, like our farm and business advising, is almost all state and federal funded. Um, we work with VHDB and um, Rural Business, USDA, Rural Business for um, a lot of those programs. <laughs> you heard a, a brief mention earlier today about the Yellow Barn uh, yeah. project. Can you, can you give us the, the a little bit. from Hardwick? Yes. Yeah. The Yellow Barn, which I'm pretty sure you'll see as you're driving on the road, um, 
it is uh, meant to hopefully be a um, kind of the next step for businesses as they outgrow this space. So like this space is for businesses that are outgrowing their home kitchen um, and need to grow and um, develop more of a market, professionalize a bit. Um, but this space also becomes too small for, for successful businesses here. And we, we sort of identified over the years the need for um, something similar but at the next level. And so the Yellow Barn um, hopefully will serve as that. I think the Yellow Barn itself will have four ten core tenants um, that could be you know, any, any different type of production in there um, with retail or whatnot. And then also a new building going up next to it, which is going to be mostly Jasper Hill. Um, they're building a second cellars in there. So I talked about how like the cheese that's made here is getting driven up to Greensboro and then getting driven back here and palletized and shipping out. Um, if they are able to build this new building and build the new cellars in there, the cheese made in Hardwick would just get driven over to that building in Hardwick and not all over um, county to county, uh, <laughs> um, which would be great for them. Um, and for us, that would also provide, you know, that anchor tenant for that facility, the way that they provide an anchor tenant in this facility to kind of stabilize if one of those core um, anchor tenant, uh, core tenant spaces in the yellow barn itself is empty for a while. It's not the end of the world because you still have your, you know, primary anchor tenant. It's a really helpful piece of any kind of variable use model, I think. I would have mentioned that it used to be like where old cars were held. How are you going to do that? Great question. Yeah, uh, it used to be a garage. It was, um, there's a Greensboro garage in Greensboro, and that was their second location. So I think it has a lot of like auto greasy smell and stuff in there. But I don't know how many years they were actually doing that in there. And it's, it's just a big old barn. I mean, the barn is over 100 years old or something. Um, so as far as remediating chemicals or whatnot from the use, um, I'm not sure, but we are going through like every permit that's required and that's, permitting is actually part of what um, is slowing down that project at this point. One permit in particular, it's like a stormwater, wastewater permit. Um, but that, that project, is, it's big and it's <coughs> ambitious, but it's also like, I think all of the funding at this point is identified if not secured and they're more or less on track to um, break ground this fall and be open next spring, I believe. So that's if, if um, the last remaining permit comes through. <laughs> yeah. Someone else back there also asked me about um, agreements with farmers for Just Cut. And that's something I didn't mention before, but we do have good faith agreements with our supplying farmers um, so that we can promise them, you know, we'll, we'll buy this many thousands of pounds of potatoes or carrots if you can grow them. If they can't grow them for whatever reason, if there is a tropical storm or if they're crop failure, they're not held to that. They're not liable for it. But they also know that if they're able to grow it, they have a place to sell it at a fixed price and it's identified. Um, and I think we had good faith agreements for seven or eight farms this past year and we're hoping to do it with nine farms this year. Um, and then, you know, we, we do have to work with additional farms if there is a crop failure or something happens, but it's um, helpful for both of us. And also, there's a bit of a learning curve with growing a turnip that works well in our, for our um, equipment that gets you the right kind of dice or, you know, the right shape, size of carrot or whatnot. So if we have those kind of longer term relationships with the same farms over time, it benefits both of us. If they're able to sell us more of their products, understanding what we need, and we're able to support more of their wholesale um, as a result. And we're hoping to start doing the same with our institutional clients. We haven't yet, but we're sort of looking forward to um, forward contracting with them. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm going to go home and make pizza for my kids. We have friends coming over. Um, yeah. That'll be fun. Cool. Thank you. So yeah. Much for Thank you so much for coming. Have fun. Have fun the rest of your tour.